Welcome everybody. Today we are talking ad creatives, uh, increasingly the biggest driver for alpha and user acquisition. So a lot of people talk about creatives at a very high level, but not today. We're going to go deep. We're going to go tactical. And to do that, we're here with Mate Lansarek from Superscale, who specializes in UA for their clients and has a lot of success in this area. And by the way, Mate, did I pronounce your last name correctly? <laughs> Um, almost, 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 but uh, yeah, it, it was good, good, very, very good for for for, for any any foreign uh, people from not from Slovakia actually because uh, it's it's well it's common common thing uh, because uh, everybody from US calls me Matej Lankarik, which is uh, well I can I can understand that, uh, but it's it's Matej Lankarik, so you got, you got it okay. very good. Thanks, thanks, man. Right. Uh, I really appreciate it. Well, let, let's first start with impact. And so for a lot of PMs and executives out in our audience, it'd be good to get a sense for just how impactful good versus bad creatives can be. Now, some people are always gonna say a good product just markets itself, but for mobile apps, I think we've got a bit of a different situation. So just to put some like high level rough numbers uh, against specific metrics, can you give us a sense of you know, the delta, the, the change we can expect from, let's say, you know, a pretty good game with uh, bad creatives and optimizing that with good creatives. What, what, what can we expect? Yeah, so uh, first of all, I mean, uh, let's, let's do, do a little bit of uh, definitions here. Like what do, what do you expect from like good or bad creative? Like how would you define that? Because I mean, I, I hear a lot of, uh, a lot of things from, from other people that, you know, hey, I, I saw the really great ad, CGI effects, um, really high production value. And then, I mean, it, is it good or bad creative? What would you say? I mean, I, I don't know. Because, you know, we should, we should definitely look at some, some numbers and, and, and KPIs. But what do you think? Like, how, how would you define the good or bad creative? Right. Right. So, I mean, you're asking me what I, I think. Of course, yeah, of course, because, yeah, I, I wanted to well, hear I mean, I, as well. I would Well, I, I would assume, you know, there's the general discussion around IPM in terms of top of funnel, but then ultimately, I would say that a good creative is one that optimizes your, your ROAS yield. Yeah, of course. Yeah, okay, okay, good. Because, um, again, then we can, we can talk about the, the creatives with good performance and bad performance, let's okay. say. So basically, and also like not only looking at RAS, obviously that's the ultimate ultimate KPI. We are um, optimizing our um, KPIs, uh, not KPIs, but um, creative towards. But also looking at the IPM, the CPI, the, the the CTRs, and also like conversion rates or click to installs. But then, um, creative easily can you know uh, break, make or break your game or your business, and this yeah. is something that that we saw also um, before for other companies I was uh, working with, uh, let's say for Pixel Federation, uh, we were running the, the soft launch uh, for Digital Adventure and getting back to this game all the time because it was like my first soft launch and global launch. And yeah. we had pretty good success with that. And we were running some, um, some campaigns and we were getting like $4 CPIs. And then, then uh, my colleague uh, brought up some very old static image and we were just thinking about using it and adding it to the to the creative mix. Then we 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 saw that uh, this this static image is performing really well. So then uh, then we added also like very very easy animations into that. And then after like doing very small changes, we were able to see like 50 cents uh, CPI. So I mean, five year old screenshot with really bad looking <laughs> everything, and the C and the, all the numbers were so great. So basically, you know, only this like comparison, like four dollar CPIs in comparison to to fifty cents. That's that's super huge, and that therefore like we were able to increase the global launch budget from like two hundred k or something to like millions, which was great. And then, so the the good creatives or good performing creatives, you need to grab the attention of the of the players, you know, immediately. Now, some say it's uh, three seconds, but you know, you're browsing the, the Facebook or Instagram and then bam, there's just one second and you need to grab the attention of the player right away. And um, what we found out also like, well, it's obviously true, right? Uh, but we were like running some, some creative for in soft launch for other games. And um, 
we were checking the the metrics back on the on the Facebook dashboards, like how, when when where when and where the people drop out from the creative after like five seconds, ten seconds, and and stuff like that. And then we found out that like the the first three or five seconds are like super boring. So we just moved like uh, the middle of the creative or the middle of the video with the like very important message to the yeah. right from the start of that creative and immediately saw like huge improvements. So uh, like talking about like decreasing the CPIs and like from 4.8 to like to 2 point something, which is great. And the CTR also improved. So you have to, you know, think about these, uh, these things when you're optimizing or building the creatives. Got it. And, and just talking about, or so, so just thinking about uh, the types of creatives and, and you, you know, is there a, can, can you, maybe we could first provide like a high level overview in terms of the type of creatives out there for our audience that may not mm -hmm. be as familiar. And then at, back to the former question in terms of like the kind of mm -hmm. delta that we can expect. And you gave one specific example, but is there a difference in terms of the performance against different types of creatives we can expect in terms of improvement for the different kinds? Mm -hmm. Okay, so there are like, um, I, will, I will talk about the Facebook creatives and mm -hmm. uh, there is like plenty of, uh, plenty of types, um, let's say like still banners or still, uh, stills and then obviously videos with different resolutions from landscape to, to square to portrait, yeah. then obviously playables. But then there are like a couple of others, which is uh, one is called Caruso, uh, which is like five or 10 um, square images right next to each other. Um, yeah. E-commerce um, really uses this format uh, well because they just show their products, but you can use this for showcasing your characters or you can use also video formats for this Caruso. So you can use a couple of sequence from, sequences from the gameplay this is pretty uh, pretty good format, and also like there is this format which is called Canvas Ad format, which is the instant experience, and we use this um, quite a lot, um, even before uh, like uh, there was there were playables. And what is this? Is actually like a small landing page or short landing page, mobile landing page, where you can describe the game. You can use different formats there, and it it really it's really immersive experience for the player and. Uh, it's, it was kind of like a hard to build, okay. but then we thought about like, okay, how we can make it actually really easy. So uh, we used all the assets we had uh, from the like store actually, and you can use text images and everything. So we built a small, let's say store uh, experience into that um, canvas ad and it was working really well. So uh, there are different, and when I'm talking about like working really well, I mean, all the IPMs increased right away. We all, always looked at the ROAS and like all the time ROAS improved with uh, all these experiments. So basically um, like moving from the static images to, to videos can, uh, can have really high impact. Um, and obviously I, you know, it really depends on, on the game um, and on targeting on any, any other variables. But then um, what we do uh, usually is like to test uh, new ideas, just using the, the static banners. And then like if there we find a winner, then obviously like moving to, to videos, which makes sense because it's, uh, it's not that expensive and we can quickly iterate on. But then um, like we have to be careful about using only static images because um, we will see like a high frank frequency for those, um, uh, for those type of creatives. So uh, people will see them quite often right, right after the first couple of days. So uh, that's why we actually mix like static images and also videos. So we have like healthy creative mix, but obviously play, I think playables as well. Uh, and then in terms of performance, like which, can, can, if you were to stack rank order these different kinds of creatives, could you do that for us? And maybe also giving us a sense of like, if you're allocating budget against these different types of creatives, mm -hmm. How does that usually, you know, I mean, I mean, I'm sure every game might be a little bit different, but like roughly what could we expect? Yeah, well, um, you obviously like focusing mostly on, on the video format. Uh, the square one has the, the highest reach and uh, the most, uh, you can leverage the most out of, out of the inventory out there. Uh, so basically like, let's say like 70% of, uh, of any, any budgets or any resources go, go to video, um, the square one. 
Yeah. Uh, but also not not forgetting about the, the landscape video, even though it's like very small format um, nowadays, but it still can, can perform really well. And then moving to fo to portrait, and and then uh, let's have like ten or fifteen percent for like testing other other types of creative, so uh, statics there and playables there. Obviously, like with playables, you can. Um, and there is the hypothesis that uh, you will get uh, the better quality players because they are already familiar with, uh, with your game, uh, because they can, you know, they can play the game and at least try try the game. So you should um, expect better better numbers. But it's not always the case, and uh, it tends to be pretty expensive uh, in terms of uh, the CPIs, and it doesn't pay off uh, on the LTV side. So that's why I mean the playables are really great format and uh, it needs some time to crack it uh, so you can uh, you can build it correctly but uh, from from my point uh, it's definitely video obviously Got and it. the different lengths you know not only using the 30 second mm -hmm. video but also like 12 15 8 even so it's all about testing <laughs> And actually, you mentioned something that's a little bit that reminded me that so you, when you talked about like having a 10 to 15 percent experimental budget, I noticed that that was a line item in a lot of, you know, with some of the previous teams that I've worked worked with having like a specific set budget for experimental types of formats and things like that. Could you talk about, you know, why people have that sort of separate budget for experimental stuff? And how do you think about coming up with a budget for that? Yeah, well, it's, uh, I think, why is it like separate? Uh, because, you know, uh, when you're experimenting a lot, this, uh, you will probably not see those money back <laughs> because it's all about exper experimenting. Yeah, well, right. let's face it, it's, yeah. it's, it's that. And that's why it's like very small portion of, of each budget. But it, eventually in, in real life, it's, it's definitely more than like 10 or 15 percent. I mean, you have to you have to be crazy, and you have to use different ideas for the creatives, and not only like uh, not only testing the different formats, but different concepts. Because now nowadays, you know, like you have the winner creative, but then you can iterate on a couple of times. But then, obviously, uh, it's not enough. That creative will eventually die after a certain period of time. So that's why you need to focus on not only iterating the the winners, but also like trying to test as, as, as many new concepts as possible. Right. And then I think just kind of moving on to uh, the next topic, I, I actually want to touch upon terminology because mm -hmm. I've noticed that a lot of different companies that there is, there are different kinds of terms used for the same thing. So yeah. basically, you know, we're all talking about whether it's IPM, right, which is so we're talking essentially impressions to installs and then within that mix, you know, so some people call it IPM, some people call it install rate, some people call it CVR, but then, and then I think everyone uses, so that equals CTR, which everyone uses, CPI everyone uses, right? So, yeah. so CTR, um, click through rate, uh, yeah. and, but then that app store conversion, there's so many different terms for that. So, you know, and basically what we're talking yeah. about potentially is, IPM or install rate equals CTR times your times. app store conversion. But yep. what terminology do you use and what, what, what can, what kind of have you seen out there? And then, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's definitely confusing and, uh, and uh, a lot of different companies use different terms. Uh, so basically what we use is uh, IPM, obviously in search per mile yep. and, um, and uh, the conversion rate, uh, for the app stores is like click to install. So I've, I've heard that uh, from, from Facebook several times that uh, they use this terminology. And um, yeah, install rate, I don't use that much uh, because then I use all, always the CPI, the IPM, and it's like, you know, I don't want to use like all the, term, all the terms for the same thing. So uh, okay. it's like keeping it easy for me and <laughs> it's the way to go. So basically, yeah, using the, IPM, CPI, CTR, the CVR obviously is the, the click to install ratio right. or the, the conversion rate right. from, from the ads to, to actually install. Right. And then, yeah, that, yeah, that would be, that would be probably it. But yeah, as you said, like different companies, different terminologies, but it's still, it's still the same thing. Same, same thing, right? <laughs> <laughs> right. And then, uh, and just while we're talking about terminology, so this is, this basically represents a lot of the, the front end top of funnel metrics. And then on the downstream side, I assume you're typically looking at, uh, you know, uh, ROAS, LTV, 
And any, anything else that you look at sort of downstream? Yeah, it's definitely like ROAS and LTV, uh, but also depends like uh, what kind of uh, life cycle or like what the stage uh, the game is in. Well, because I'm saying this because, uh, for example, for soft launches, um, when you are in the retention stage, I mean, obviously like um, checking the monetization and LTV doesn't make that much sense. So the, in, in that stage, I'm looking at the retention numbers and uh, obviously like IPMs and everything, but the retention numbers, because I want to see like if this, um, this creative resonates well with the audience and also bringing the good quality players because the CPI can be, can be super low, but then you check the retention and, and you will see like, okay, so uh, yeah, this is not what I want to, want to see. And you will see like lower retention numbers. But if you don't check that, you, you don't know. So uh, yeah, it's definitely definitely retention that I check wow. also in the soft in the soft launch. Right. So you're checking just just to be clear for our audience, you're actually checking yep. retention against ad creatives. And then how far down in terms of retention is it? Like D one seven thirty, or are you going further out? Oh, it's D one seven mostly. Okay. Uh, then like because yeah, as as you said, like um, because in soft launch is super important. Uh, to check like what's going on also in the game and but also in on, on the marketing side and uh, the ad level um, KPIs in that stage that's definitely definitely retention numbers okay cool so I wanted to now talk about the creatives team because when we look at creatives teams at different studios you know there's there's a lot of different things that we see so in terms of like the composition of the team, could you talk about, you know, how would you structure a creative team for the typical game studio? And then what are the key drivers? Like, what do you think about to help you determine, you know, the, the what are the key drivers or key variables that help you determine what that team should look like? Okay, good. Very good question. And uh, I will just um, speak about how we build the team at Superscale because okay. uh, the creative team as well, because um, when, when I joined, there's like um, five UA, UA guys and uh, no creatives. Uh, so uh, that was, that's really, really weird. So uh, we started building this and um, as a, as a head of UA uh, and I was like in charge of this. So I, I was thinking about like, who should I, who should I bring in? And uh, that was the key question, and this is like something the like a philosophy that I uh, I think it's it's really important to bring the right people on the bus and put it in in the right seats. And uh, and basically, I was um, thinking about my network and who would be the right uh, who would be the right uh, right to bring in. So basically, I I had uh, two two candidates for like idea making and copywriting which is which was like something that we definitely need because like ua people and ua guys obviously can and uh, and do also think about the creatives all the time and talk with the creative team but then there needs to be a middleman some someone who can talk to the ua managers and also to can talk to the creative team so basically i I found two guys in my network with zero um, gaming experience, but those were both of them pretty good gamers, playing games all the time, pretty good experience from marketing um, here in Slovakia. Because we actually, we have uh, pretty good uh, and pretty talented people here. So um, my, also like my philosophy is that uh, to bring like the local talent here and give, give, them, give them a chance to, to thrive. So, I picked up this this guy who was um, immediately hired um, after some some assignments, obviously, and um, we gave him like very very easy assignment to do, which uh, which was to create some some ideas for our games. And then then he he gave us like fifty pages PDF presentation. I was like, Ooh, okay, this is the this is the attitude I really want to see. This is the approach that uh, I want to see uh, in the team. So basically, um, right after he was hired, then after one month, he became the, the creative lead. And he's like the best asset I could, I could ever imagine to have in the team. And then we together sat down and started looking uh, at our portfolio and our like um, games we manage, games we could potentially manage. I started thinking about like, who should we bring? Also like motion designers, 3D guys, illustrators, 2D motion designers. And, and then we created created these requirements and then started the hiring. But also like we brought 
several guys with uh, a lot of experience from gaming here from Slovakia, from um, other gaming companies here. So all the senior guys, but then obviously I want to have a mix of senior people and then a junior, junior guys who can learn and, and grow. And that's why uh, we also like hired these two, uh, two junior guys, young couple actually illustrators. And it was like one, one year ago. And I could see the, the progress and the so much improvement of, of what they've done for that year. But that was like because of the, all the mix of uh, the senior guys with the gaming experience, but not only having those guys, but also like giving a chance and giving the opportunity to the, to the other talented people with the winning attitude, winning approach to, the, um, to work, to have this mix so we can, uh, we can uh, mentor them and, and, and see them grow. And this is something that, uh, that I think it's, uh, it's what I would do for any, any other gaming company. And then obviously like looking at the hard skills, uh, that's just uh, something that we definitely need to, need to, need to check before, before even uh, getting those guys uh, for the interview. So basically getting them a paid assignment uh, because we, we used all the time, like uh, the ideas that, that Martin created, uh, the creative lead to, to send them. And then after they passed the, the obviously the assignment, then, we talked and this is like very important for me. It's not, it's not only about the experience, but also about their attitude and their approach and all the soft skills and, you know, how they will fit into the team because everything can be, can be teach and can be learned. So that's a really important thing is for me, especially is how the, the new guys can fit into the team and fit into the atmosphere. Yeah. And then everything is easy, obviously. Yeah, so, but- just to kind of dig a little bit deeper into like how you figure out the structure. So you've got like this creative lead person mm-hmm. who yep. seems like the idea, idea person. And then you've got, like you mentioned certain kinds of artists, whether it's 2d, 3d, 2d motion, 3d motion. Mm-hmm. But then how do you determine the size of those teams? And, and maybe it, even an additional question would be then how do you also determine in-house versus outsource? I mean, do you kind of look at a game? Do you, you know, some people will do it based on percent of budget. Some people will do it based upon, you know, like the creatives cadence and then depending on the types of creatives and, but yeah, yeah. Maybe I'll let you talk in terms of how you actually figure out the the composition and the size of the team. Yeah. So size of the team, uh, we are at the moment like uh, 25 people, which is like 18 people from, uh, from creative team and others are, from UA, so basically we we were <clears throat> growing like crazy in the last in the last year. Well, well, crazy for for our standards yeah. uh, in the last in the last year, um, and we just hit uh, hit the good spot and sweet spot for like all the clients or all the partners we have and we had before. So we don't need like anybody else because again, like different budgets and different games require different cadence of the of the new creatives. So basically, we were looking at like the again the, the spend and the <clears throat> and the resources those those uh, those partners of ours ha- um, actually have. So basically, um, at the moment we are pretty much u- utilized. But then, obviously, if we got any any new clients or any new partners, then we would need definitely some some more some more talent to bring in. So basically, like based on the on the number of spend, the number of of clients, and then like cadence that just came all together, and uh, that was the final number at that point. And this is like something that uh, we are now okay with. But then, obviously, as I said, that getting getting any any new clients, we have some buffer. But then getting any new big clients, then that would definitely mean that we should be looking out for we should be looking for um, any other new new hires. And then I was also just trying to understand why, like some games, like a Matchington Mansion, for example, Mm -hmm. rumored they've got 30 plus people in-house, plus they use outsourcing companies just just for creatives. That's their creatives team. And then other studios have like a few dedicated people. So could you speak to like, maybe it's kind of a way of, you know, rephrasing the previous question, but why would some games have so many people and some games not have so many people? Like how how should people... You know how should yeah. about that? 
Okay, so uh, let's uh, let's uh, talk about let's see for for the the matching convention. So they have the in-house team uh, pretty big. Uh, they're spending pretty big money uh, from or we're spending pretty big yeah. money. So you need you need uh, like fresh creatives every week, definitely, and that's not a small number. I mean, if you are spending millions, then you need a lot of new creatives because, yeah, they will they will uh, fade off quite quite quickly, and then. Uh, what is really great uh, also with like uh, using outsourcing um, companies is that you will get like a new, new ideas, new pair of eyes and definitely like uh, different processes. So uh, that's why, you know, um, a lot of bigger, bigger companies um, divide these budgets like for the, like the, their resources into like uh, in-house teams and then they hire a lot of uh, outsourcing companies just to have more creative and different kind of concepts that they can just, I think, <laughs> At, uh, at the moment because you know after working on some on some game for a longer period of time you 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 just quickly get to like this routine you're not seeing any other concepts anymore and um, that's that's where you know outsourcing company can bring a lot of value and then uh, you said that uh, some other companies have small teams well obviously if you don't have resources to build a bigger team it's hard to you know expand also hard, hard to use any outsourcing companies uh so yeah i mean the all the gaming companies um use well the the first thing to do is to build in-house team and then like go to outsourcing ones right and then just going back to that question in terms of mm -hmm. in-house versus outsource yeah. you know how how do you make that decision between what to outsource and what to what to insource <laughs> well uh, for me uh, from my perspective perspective is um you know um it's you need as i said before is you need new ideas and you need actually uh, at some point test the crazy ideas as well to see like what's working out and uh, what's resonating well with your target audience and that's that's where the outsourcing companies can help right away okay. because if you see if you see that you are like you know uh, running around and still using the the very similar creative con creative concept then probably there's the the best time to start looking for for any ad additional pair of eyes, okay. but there is like giving you any percentages of or or, or any any exact numbers. It's, it's kind of hard because it all all depends on all the all the other vari variables. Right. So Mate, I thought we could just kind of stop for a second here and then actually talk about you and Superscale. So uh, <laughs> maybe could could we talk about like you, your background, your career, just so people have a better sense of who you are, and then. You know, it might be great to hear a little bit about Superscale in terms of what you guys are doing right now and maybe some of the games that you guys have been able to successfully kind of launch. Sure, yeah, very, very happy to speak about the myself and, and, and Superscale as well. So again, my name is Matija Lančeric. <laughs> I'm based in, in Slovakia and I'm from Slovakia and I've been in the industry for like seven years so far. I uh, started in 2013 uh, working at Pixel Federation, which is the biggest uh, gaming company here. Then uh, after five years, I just joined um, Superscale as a head of UA and uh, overseeing all the UA activities um, for all the partners. But then on 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 the same time, I also like uh, work as a, like consultant for a couple of years already. At the same time, I'm, like trying to help other gaming companies to grow their games and and businesses. Okay. And and basically, like uh, regarding Superscale, uh, which is uh, well. A lot of people say we are an agency or a vendor, which is not true, or a publisher, which is not true as well. So uh, the thing is that we actually um, trying to scale games and uh, how we do that is that uh, we do the scalability assessments of all the games uh, out there and trying to look at uh, like, uh, different aspects of the game from game design, monetization, data infrastructure, obviously UA and creatives. Because the, the 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 company started as a business intelligence company and then evolved into what we are what we are now. So uh, yeah, we've been able to work with a couple of games from EA um, and, and Lego, uh, which uh, I hope I can share. Uh, not specifically specifically the the game game names, but uh, these were the biggest uh, companies that we are starting to work from uh, this year. Okay, great. Okay, cool. And, and so maybe now we could talk about this question around, well, so one of the things we talked about is 
having some type of overall framework. And I know you have a specific framework that you use. So can we talk about that now? Can you describe what do you mean by a creative framework? And so what is it and how is it structured? Yeah, of course. So basically, uh, we have this, uh, this process uh, that we kind of developed uh, through the time. I mean, it's, uh, it's basically like there are two ways. Uh, first is the, like the regular um, creative um, framework, which is like, uh, you know, doing the creative analysis, obviously, like all the assessments for, for the game, uh, games that we manage, but also like competitor analysis as well. So basically, based on those assessments, we are like, brainstorming the new ideas, um, looking at the actually target audience of the game as well. So we know like what could potentially resonate well uh, with that target audience and uh, brainstorming the ideas. Uh, obviously like choosing the ideas and like back and forth with the client uh, and then like choosing the, the first sketches and then processing and then like creative testing and uh, obviously like evaluating uh, that in our internal tool. But what is here like uh, very important to to mention in this frame framework of where I, how I call it is the is the actually testing or like uh, using those um, new ideas and how we test them on Facebook because I I've heard a lot that like a lot of other companies have different the ways of testing it and they're using either like test account where they only test uh, those creatives and then like move the winners to the to the ad account of the the, the main ad account. Other other people use so like only app installs campaigns for like creative testing because they they say it's uh, it's much cheaper to get uh, and much faster to get uh, the winners, which can be true. But then you have to think about like how the actual Facebook work and if you if you use different optimizations like uh, app install optimization or purchase optimized campaigns or value optimized campaigns, you will get different results with the same creative so this is very important i mean i'm not i don't, I don't say like the other um, methods or ways are wrong it just didn't didn't really work out well for me so that's uh, so basically like when i get the creative i'm using the same target audience and the same optimizations to have clear picture of how this creative resonates with uh, resonates with my target audience and with that specific audience that i use in the campaign so basically using the campaign budget optimizations and then like creating the same ad, creating a new ad set with the same targeting, same structure, but then adding only new creatives. So we have, let's say, I'm going a little bit deeper here. So <laughs> uh, we have, uh, we have uh, the basic campaign structure with one ad set, running the creative there, running the, the purchase optimization. And then we see the creative um, fatigue you and we see that uh, the the numbers are going slightly down and you see that the CTR is decreasing, mm -hmm. the CPI rising after the first couple of days. So in here, in, in this framework, I use the new creatives, but with the same audience with the same campaign, just creating the, the new ads there and letting the campaign budget optimization spread the, the, the budget. And if I, after like first couple of days, you, you can clearly see if the new creative is outperforming the, the old one or not. And then if yes, then obviously like pausing, pausing the, the old creatives and then running the, the whole budget into the new creative. So basically like the, this, would be, this would be like the, the testing methodology and the testing and creative framework I'm, I'm always uh, talk about. And this is something that proved to be really working for me and uh, the games we manage. Yeah. Uh, and again, I'm not saying like the other ways are not, not right or not correct, but didn't work out that well for me as, as this, because this is like, you know, you see the, the same creative with the same optimization method, it's the, the same events. And you know, even though it's, it's slightly, slightly more expensive, but then you have the clear winner and you can clearly make a decision based on these, uh, these numbers. Okay, so maybe we could just take a step back in terms of the, the yep. creative framework. And so just for our audience, and especially for those who are listening, so you've got like the six steps. One, creative analysis. Two, brainstorming. Three, yep. choosing the idea. Four, 
first sketches and processing, five creative testing, yeah. six evaluation. So let's talk about one, the creative analysis. Can you talk about, so what, what, what are the types of, you know, analysis that you're doing in that first step? Yeah, so uh, depends on the on the game uh, stage again. Um, we we are uh, jumping in. I mean, uh, you always look at the at the previous previous creatives and how they performed, uh, which is like the the first thing that everybody needs to do, and I, I think everybody needs to do when uh, starting to work on game. If there is no numbers or there are no numbers to to look at, then obviously we are trying to analyze the competitors and look at what worked for them. Uh, these are the types of like the creative, the first creative assessments. And based on those, uh, you know, looking at obviously like if, if we have uh, any any uh, past numbers, we're looking at the ROAS and the LTVs of, of those creatives and which performed well and trying yeah. to find out why. And then and those learnings we are trying to bring into the brainstorming sessions. So we know like what to talk about. Yeah, so that I, I assume for that you might use some tools like Sensor Tower and sort of what what's worked well. You'll look at like let's say you you've got a mid core game and you're looking at uh, like mid core RPG game. You're looking at like let's say AFK Arena. You've got like those creators with the mass hordes of zombies and stuff coming yeah. in. Like okay, these things seem to be resonating. And so so then you're just kind of looking at what's kind of happened in the market, what's performed well. There's stuff that you've worked on in the past and kind of try to figure that out. Then that takes us to step two, which is your brainstorming phase. And yep. so in the brainstorming phase, do you, are, is there some kind of structure there? Or do you just like say, okay, what are all the ideas? And just kind of write down all the ideas and then kind of think through that. Or how, what does that step look like? Yeah, so basically all the, all the brainstorming sessions have, have the, the moderator there, uh, who is like okay. moderating all the, all the session and, and then uh, obviously like writing down the, all the ideas. Uh, Obviously, like after these brainstorming sessions, well, the the main point here is like not to bring everybody on the on, on the brainstorming sessions. Like as uh, as you know, a little people in there. Like let's keep it like three or four people maximum, because like if you have like five, six, seven people, like not everybody can uh, can brainstorming, and it's like a whole a whole bunch a whole mess. You just can't yeah. can't work on that. But uh, yeah, let's keep it uh, a small small. A small group and what uh, would actually like not only like having these uh, moderators there and writing down the ideas and what proved to be pretty um, successful and and good is to actually bring the game designers or, or pms to the brainstorming sessions right. <laughs> to know like uh, because it's it's very helpful to see uh, and to hear their ideas and how they think about the game and uh, also from their point, they, they hear like our um, perception of the game. And then because a lot of time there are like two different worlds. But then in this, you know, in this case, we're trying to bridge uh, like uh, those two worlds and uh, to, to work closely together. And this proved to be very beneficial for like uh, not only the brainstorming sessions, but also like the, the final creatives. Yeah. Okay, and then we go to step three, which is choosing the idea. So who actually, like, how do you choose the idea and who chooses it? Is it that creative's lead person or is it somebody else? It's, it's basically um, a combination of, uh, of our suggestions and our creative leads, yeah. uh, creative lead. And then obviously like the partner based on our suggestions, obviously because we have uh, plenty of other um, experiences from other games that we have like more data points so we can uh, make proper suggestions like what sh we sh we think should work but then obviously like c partner or client is the has the final word so uh, uh, then we just pick I don't know like three or five depends on the on the cadence or, or the budget three to five ideas and then go for the like the first sketches and, and then the processes right and then what what is that like the first sketches and then is first sketches just for stills or like uh, what, what about for, for playables? What would first sketches look like uh, for different kinds? Yeah, the of first, yeah, for, uh, for first sketches for playables, uh, that's definitely a storyboard. Um, okay. So, you know, everybody can, can uh, see clearly see like what will be in, the, in that playable, like every step. 
because you know if we don't do this and then start building the playable it takes a lot of time and a lot of resources to build it and after you know just to to hear from the client like hey well this is not what i imagined well it happens a lot uh but that's that's why we just you know not only what we are but i think like a lot of other gaming companies do these um, storyboards so everybody is on the same page so this is like this is a very important step so everybody is on the same page so everybody has some expectations of of the new creatives uh so you know you avoid any any mistakes or any miscommunications right so that was step four and step five creative testing and you you were kind of touching upon this in, yep. in terms of the testing and evaluation but maybe you could uh, be a little bit uh, more specific in terms of what happens during testing versus evaluation phase yeah so um so then uh, we have these like five five creatives and five new concepts so basically like um running them immediately into the new ad set, as I, as I, as I mentioned, yeah. uh, because then like there's no, uh, no need for, for any weight. And uh, we just need to throw it out and see like the, the first numbers. So usually this like testing, um, period is like, depends on, obviously depends on the budget, but we see like first, um, I don't know, five to seven days when we are spending like, like significantly high, <laughs> higher numbers, then obviously one or two days are enough. I mean, I can't say like any specific number of impressions because it's just, uh, you know, I would be making this up. Uh, but then you clearly see after first three days or first five days, uh, any trends um, where the, the new creative is going. So then after we see the, um, the winner there or, or a loser, because not every creative, even though you have all these processes, not every, cre every new creative is a winner. Then uh, we need to go, we need to, take a step back and evaluate like why is this a loser why is this a winner as well right. and then try to gain uh, again go back to the brainstorming uh, step and then um, create the new ideas based on those uh, evaluations but right. obviously like not not uh, deconstructing also only the the creative concept but also looking at the, the ROAS numbers in this especially <laughs> in this step because that's the most important KPI Okay, and so this this phase is a little bit iterative, and then you, you're really trying to understand why are some of these creatives working, why are some of these not, and then doubling down on the stuff that works, and and trying to trying to push through that. Okay, yeah, cool. And and then um, and, and you you also mentioned I I guess as part of this creative testing phase, you're also looking at sort of the the you know downstream metrics, or is that part of the evaluation phase? It's mostly like, you know, part of the analysis, obviously, like uh, looking at the downstream metrics, but also, uh, but then uh, it's part of the evaluation, of, yeah. of course. I mean, obviously, um, we can, we can look at the, the IPNs, but eventually, like, I mean, the, the RAS is, or the LTV is the, the true KPI that actually makes sense here. Right. Now, is there, and so once, once you've, you've got this process down and you're coming up with a lot of great creatives, I, I would say that the next big question on my mind would be, then how do you come up with that pipeline in terms of like, you know, we're going to do this many creatives yep. per week, per two weeks, per month. Like, how do you come up with the cadence, the number of variants, and when to swap things out? Like, how, how do you think about that? Yeah, so uh, the first part of the question, like how we come up with the different ideas. Um, so basically, um, looking at the, the actual situation uh, on the market and like um, doing this competitive creative analysis as well, as you mentioned, like AFK Arena, for example. But then obviously like looking at the, the, the trends in the hyper-casual space, because we find out that uh, a lot of um, the creatives that use um, the hyper-casual games, we can use also for for any other games, uh, any other genre. Uh, let's say uh, we have a simulation game or a farming game or whatever. And we can show like the clear, clear progress there, like the day one versus day 30 or day 60 or day 90. This is, you know, this is showing the, the real progress in, in, the, in the one creative. Uh, this is resonating really well or like any, any new noob versus pro variations for, uh, PvP games or, or any action games, this is something that works really well. But not only like taking a look at the the hyper casuals, but we also look at the like YouTube trends. For example, you know, there is a couple of videos that people open chests in the games 
and those videos have like millions of views. Right. So then we found like, okay, let's, let's use this in, in the creative as well. And um, it actually performed pretty well as well, because, you know, this is something that people love to watch and uh, why not to use it in, in the creative as well. If you have, obviously, if you have chests in the game, but then not only YouTube trends, but also memes, memes and any hype. Um, for example, memes, we use a lot of like Drake um, <laughs> creatives uh and uh, a lot of uh, a lot of other other memes that we can use at the moment and then from these memes we just go from like static images to to videos because you know you can very easily do do so but also um speaking about the hype i mean um so back then when the the video series launched on, on netflix we just uh, you know we we saw that um, the Witcher is, is pretty similar to one of uh, one of the, the the characters in the almost the hero game, the uh, game from a Spanish developer. So we created the a hilt chair because uh, the guy from the game is uh, called Hilt, and we just you know it was very clearly um, clear s similarity between the Witcher and the hilt chair, right? And and the, the numbers just blew off immediately. Everybody was like commenting, wow, this is amazing. The ROAS went immediately up. It was really great. So basically like using these hypes and like um, leveraging the, the ideas and the characters you have uh, in the game and you go a little bit crazy sometimes, uh, that, can, that can be like pretty, pretty beneficial. And, and you know, we use, we have like a very, um, very strange sense of humor uh, in in our uh, in our team, so we try to use that also uh, in those creatives, and obviously like it depends on the on the target audience of the game. I mean, we use like humor situation with uh, thanks a lot um, that you know the target audience is male, I don't know twenty five plus. They they love Family Guy or Regan Morty, so this is this is the humor we we try to replicate also in our creatives. Right. But then, and then uh, also we're trying to look at the, at the, at the different like views on different uh, aspects of like the characters. For example, we, we did a like interview with, uh, with the villain from the, from the, almost the hero as well, like to, to get the, the different, <laughs> different side of the, of the game. So he was like, you know, complaining about, about how the, how the characters are still, you know, every day is the same thing. He was complaining about the, the characters, how they attack him, and you know he, he needs to go to the work. And we saw like so many great uh, comments and engagements on that creative. People were like crazy. Whoa, I like this. I like this idea. This is I'm gonna try this game just because of this ad because it looks legit. I mean, these are the types of of things that we try to do uh, regularly. Yeah. And uh, yeah, this this is something that that pretty much work uh, but you know it's all tied to the to the target audience this is really important to know uh who is your target audience like what do they like what resonates well i mean you see uh, you saw like the the lily's garden creatives right i mean the target audience for lily's garden it's obviously like uh, women and they definitely like these kind of like storylines and and these kind these like not not like soap operas, but anything like this, oh, you know. Man. Yeah, drama. It's like this is this is so great, and you can you can ex actually leverage these kind of things. This is something that we used also uh, for for one cooking game, because you know we we just used a couple that came into the into the restaurant, and you 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 could see the headline like, "Hey, your ex boyfriend just walked walked in," and then you have two two options poison him or um, bring him the food. And this is, these are the types of creatives that, prof that resonate very well with the, the female target audience because this is, this is what they like. I mean, and this is something that, you know, depends on the target audience. Obviously, like, we can't use these things for, for male audience. But then for male audience, we try to do this humor situation for thanks a lot. Uh, for example, we did that with a couple of tanks. And so, yeah, uh, uh, depends on the target audience. That's, why, that's how we can come up with uh, the different ideas. And, 
trying to monitor all, all the trends, not only not only on Facebook, but also like memes and, and the, the actual situation on the market. Got it. Um, and then maybe maybe in terms of just closing the loop as far as metrics and evaluation, uh, maybe there's two questions I can ask you about this. First, I know we've talked offline about how some genres like hyper casual are looking at slightly different metrics, right? So they're not as yeah. focused in terms of top of funnel front end on IPM. They're more focused on CTR. And so wanted to like provide the audience your take on that. Uh, but yeah, maybe we could start there and then I'll ask you the second question as well later. Yeah. So um, like for hyper casuals, I mean, they are definitely looking at the, at the IPM because that's like, not, that's the like super important thing. Um, yeah. But I think like the, the question was uh, more about uh, different podcasts. You you were speaking about uh, like the concept testing and uh, uh, the marketability of the of those games. And uh, I think there was like uh, some some question about why they why the hyper casual focus uh, on the CTRs. I mean, they obviously focus on other other things as well. But they've done so many tests, so they have a lot of a lot of numbers to work with. So uh, they can clearly calculate all the other metrics from those um, benchmarks they already have. So basically like Voodoo have a lot of C CPC metrics and CTRs and they, they know like if they're looking at like 11% 11, 11 uh, CTR and like two cents CPC, the CPI will be like 10 cents or maybe even less. So this is how, how they approach those metrics. Yeah, this and just to provide the audience a little more context. So I had an opportunity to speak with some of the, you know, a few top hyper casual companies. And, you know, what they were telling me is that they don't even like they, they don't even have a game, right? <laughs> they're, they're, of course, they're just testing a video, they're testing this. And then once the CTR is good, then they'll make the game. So yeah, that, that was the, the context on that. Of, co of course, because you know, the, the video is actually the game <laughs> it's like the, <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> yeah the video is like you can well you, you clearly need to see like the game mechanic and uh and this that's it because like you have like 10 second video and uh after you watch you after you watch the video you you can clearly see what's the game what the game is going to be about and if again as you said that if if the ctr is good uh, and good is like five percent and above uh then obviously yeah why not to make the game? Right. And then the other sort of evaluation question that I had for you was with respect to like the downstream metrics. And we've kind of alluded to this before in terms of measuring ROAS and stuff like that. But I, I think a lot of this came from uh, the deceptive ads, right? And so there were, what we saw were a lot of deceptive ads being used. And based upon that, the, the front end metrics were very strong. And then there was like this assumption in the industry by some game studios that great, you know, our front end metrics are a lot higher, but then later on, it's like, Oh wait, we brought all these players in expecting game a, they got game B and then the ultimate downstream metrics as good. And so could you talk about, you know, sort of that phenomenon and uh, you know, is, is, and, and in terms of the downstream metrics that we should measure is ROAS the only thing, and then are you measuring from a downstream perspective? How, what, do you, what do you actually measure in terms of you know, DX ROAS? And if it's DX ROAS, then what, what's the X? Is it seven, is it 30, or how do you come up with that? Yeah, so um, regarding the DX ROAS, it's, uh, it's definitely like um, different from and dependent on the game. Yeah. But um, looking at, uh, at the, not only D7 because um, obviously D7 is not the, the only only metric, and then like long-term metric on um, day 30 ROAS, for example. But we need to know how does the curve look like, the LTV curve look like, and, and compare that to actual uh, create compare that to to the creative level, because you know you, you see like from the from your um, analytics that how the curve the LTV curve should should look like, and then you just go down to the creative level. And this is this is super important, obviously. So that's there. You have like day one, day three, day seven, and day like so let's say day twenty eight, and you compare the how the ROAS should look like with the creative, and then make decisions. But uh, like back to the those deceptive ads. I mean, uh, I can still see a lot of um, guidance caves and hopes caves uh, ads for uh, 
for their games and and thing is and, and also like Lily's Garden I mean there's no almost nothing uh, from the game but then it was the um, the creative was so interesting and I, I actually read that in, in some comments in the Lily's Garden, there's like, well, okay, so the, uh, the creative got my attention. I expect totally different game, but then I just started to play the game and um, it's actually fun and I, I was hooked immediately. So the thing is like, if you, if you get the, a lot, loads of, of players into the, into the game with, uh, with low CPIs, then there is a higher chance of of uh, success of like converting those those players into the actual players and then into the payers eventually. So, and the thing is, I'm 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 not sure if you remember, but uh, Kings of Avalon had also this this great 3D 3D ad that didn't look anything like the game, but then. <laughs> Nothing like the game experience, but then I I assume that uh, it worked really well. Okay, King of Avalon. Huh? <laughs> okay, let's move on. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, but you know, actually, while we're talking about deceptive ads, I, I know Google had some recent uh, policy that talked about banning these kinds of deceptive ads. But do you think, like, what if if that's true? I, I don't know if you have any. Uh, context in terms of what you know uh, of that policy, but what what do you think will happen in terms of the industry, uh, assuming that get, gets rolled out not only on you know Google but also on Facebook and elsewhere? Yeah, so um, these deceptive ads. I mean, all the policy from from Google. I mean, they they release this uh, policy, but then uh, when it's actually going to happen, nobody knows because yeah. it's it's always like this with Google. Um, I have Google friends, so sorry guys but it's still it takes so much so it takes so long to get uh, like those deceptive ads out of the game and out of the like the marketing game because they okay <laughs> that's for google i mean that's definitely something that's not going to happen anytime soon but then uh, i think like i'm worried about the facebook because uh, it's it's more flooded with all these ads and it, it's starting to be annoying and and you know definitely need some some actions here and at, uh, as soon as possible because you know we are we are trying to create um, experience and trying to set some expectations for the players uh, but also on the other hand I, I get the, the the metrics and the business side of, of those deceptive ads I mean actually I guess they, they work pretty well in, in, in the in the Ross perspective but we are you know we should be player friendly here. Yeah. And trying to be trying to create the player friendly um, experience experiences in in those ads, so they actually like what they see, and they and they are not like they they know what they are getting with the uh, with the creative, and they know what to expect when mm -hmm. they are actually getting into the game. Right. That's why I think like the, this should happen, but you know when. That's a that's a very good question, and I don't think it's it's gonna be anytime soon, unfortunately. <laughs> okay, so maybe one of the other big open <laughs> topics from a creative's optimization perspective is this issue around creative fatigue. And so, and by creative fatigue for our audience, it's when you know you've got the same creative that might be performing very highly, but people have seen it over and over again, and so the performance top starts to drop. And so, from your perspective, Mate, like. How do you measure this? And when do you know when you should retire a creative? And then on the flip side, you know, when do you know when you can bring back an old creative that performed very highly in the, in the past and, and, you know, kind of res resurrect it? Yeah, so um, I don't think that there is like any specific point uh, for, for all the creatives. So all, all the creatives, like different creatives have different life, lifetime. And, uh, but you can clearly see after like, um, Certain period of time, let's say um, I don't know what well, some some creatives can can work for several years. Uh, I was uh, talking about the Diggs Adventure, and we were running this one horrible, ugly-looking creative for three years. We spent like I don't know, like ten millions into that creative. Wow. Still profitable, still profitable, uh, and we were just you know that was just our evergreen creative. And then just performing well for two years, and I see I see those uh, those guys still, still like 
hovering around this uh, this creative, working with that with uh, with uh, slightly better visuals, but still the creative is still there. And um, so after you know after two years, then obviously this is the time you see that uh, you launch the campaign with the same creative. It's not performing well. The CTRs are super low, and uh, you, you can clearly see that uh, it, res it stopped resonating well. So you need to move on, but that doesn't mean you, you just can't like after half a year you can resurrect the you can't resurrect the, the credit and that's what we that's what we did uh, a couple of times before so i mean there is not like you can resurrect any creative after a half a year it's just you know it needs some time there's no no silver bullet i think here but uh you know from time to time it's good to refresh those old evergreens and uh, start uh, start um, adding them to the to the campaigns and, and regarding the creative fatigue, as, as I mentioned, it's like it's different from uh, from other um, creative concepts. So basically, we can we can run a creative for months and it's still performing well. But then some creatives have like a couple of days, and then that's it. And um, I wasn't able to like crack why is this happening, but uh, it's like eventually you you need to take a look at the the combination of the creative and the targeting and try to make any assumptions or like any any uh, data take up from that from that combination because then um after using the the creative uh with a different target audience with the slightly different geos it can still work pretty well but on that specific targeting and that specific uh, combination of of the campaign structure it just just can't work anymore and uh it's all all about evaluation you you will see that in that uh, like point of the process that uh this is the time for like changing the creatives right. but i i you know can't speak about like any any specific numbers here because it depends on got it and so uh it's it's an art you're saying and you just you kind of need to use common sense and i i can kind of understand that because there could be a lot of exogenous factors that impact the creative so like let's say you've yeah. got a super performant creative and then you're your lead competitor sees that and they copy it and then then that could lead to creative fatigue. But yeah. are, are there specific things that you watch for, whether it's like a, a dip in uh, KPIs of a certain level or whether you look at like the scale of spend relative to your the size of your target group or is, is there anything that will help inform, well, maybe this is creative fatigue or not? Yeah. So um. Yeah. Looking at like different uh, different factors and variab variables, uh, it's definitely like the combination of um, potential reach of the of the target audience and how big is the target audience, and um, also like at the, of the spend as well. And I'm looking at like any any um, dips in terms of the CTRs um, because obviously like when you launch the creative and, and it's it's clearly a winner, it starts performing really well from the beginning. And uh, we have these benchmarks of, of CTRs and CPIs and everything. And then like if uh, the creative dips um, under those benchmarks, we just, you know, that's the red flag and we need to keep a close eye on that. So basically like for purchase campaigns, like looking at the, at the CTRs, and everything like under the 0.5%, it's starting to, be, uh, starting to be a signal that we need to take a look at these, uh, these creatives. And uh, and obviously, like when you see like the CPI trend is increasing day by day, and you don't see the the stable CPIs anymore, that's the also that's the signal when you need need to you know get attention. Like okay, this is this is something we need to look at. Uh, but then like the CPIs rising can be also the fact that you are reaching the the whole target audience. But then again, like as as I mentioned before, with this you can just swap out the the creative and then you restart the, the process again. So uh, even with the, with the same target audience. Got it. And so last question for you, Monte, and mm -hmm. potentially a very, crit you know, very critical question, which is tools. So can you talk about some of the tools you're using for creatives optimization? Because I mean, I've seen all sorts of stuff out there, but it'd be great to understand from your perspective, what are some of the critical tools you can use to really help you be as efficient and effective as possible in terms of creatives optimization. Yeah, of course. I mean, uh, there are plenty of tools uh, and fancy tools you can you can use, and I use like uh, Looker, Tableau, or I don't know AppSummer or any any other tools. 
uh, for like any creative uh, optimizations. But then uh, we built um, in-house um, creative uh, tool where we like uh, try to evaluate all the campaigns on the creative level. Uh, but basically, um, if you are using FMPs as like Facebook marketing partners, um, a lot of them have uh, really good, uh, really good creative dashboards, and um, if uh, that's something that is actually really efficient. But then, not every company has all those all those resources and budgets to to work with uh, with the tools. So basically, then if you're a small company, then and you can't afford these, then you you you, are, you should be good with all the all the Facebook dashboards and all the Excel sheets and apps layers. Uh, but then it's uh, it's really painful and and a lot of um, a lot of time uh, you need to be in those spreadsheets. So if you have resources, then obviously like all those tools and all those FMPs and creative dashboards can really help. And that's that's why we actually build those uh, creative tools uh, in house. Because we have these raw sheets where we like evaluate all the campaigns, and then we just said like, "Hey, well, let's go uh, to the to the creative level, so we can we can do the make decisions based on on the on the real data." Actually, okay. And just to kind of take a little bit of a higher level perspective in terms of the tools, so you mentioned things like Looker and Tableau, and I, I'm assuming for that, that's really about your your data infrastructure and in creating like uh, dashboards and a way of visualizing like a BI perspective yeah. in terms of what's performing, how you're doing the the sort of analysis piece, and then when you talk about spreadsheets and uh, you know this would be great uh, for me to ask you because in my own experience when it comes to sort of managing, archiving, and putting spe specific metrics to creatives themselves, what I've seen are just like these crazy spreadsheets with like <laughs> and, and like and literally you've got somebody spending two to three hours a day just like you know input yeah, and updating these spreadsheets now i know there are some companies like you know for example badalgo comes to mind that help you like you know have a like a holistic view in terms of mm -hmm. all your creatives and, and attach metrics to them and things like that but is there a better tool or is this what you guys have been building in-house or yeah, yeah, this is this is actually like what we uh, building in house, and uh, I mean, as uh, as mentioned, the Facebook marketing partners. So when you when you are uh, running the or creating the campaigns with uh, Bidalgo or Smartly or Adquant by Kenshu, uh, you have these creative dashboards because they they all have the the creatives um, set up there, and uh, it's pretty easy. But what is really important to to measure the the uh, the KPIs and the creative is also like the naming conventions because uh, then you clearly see what is inside the creative and what is there, um, how long it is, is it, uh, is it portrait square or whatever. So you just don't need to like see all creative by one by one. So you just have to see like what is inside. And so this is like very important, like to have proper naming conventions for those. And if there is the spreadsheet, then I am, I'm not sure like how, how long you could you could be um, working with the spreadsheets because that's just that's just too much, and that's right. that's, uh, that's too much. So yeah, I mean like all the all the all the tools like you mentioned the Bidalgo internal tools, um, Looker Tableau that uh, can you know be very time efficient. Definitely, definitely better way of uh, of doing um, creative analysis and evaluation than like. All, looking into spreadsheets but then obviously again if you're a small company you you should uh, you should work with yeah not not just analysis but i, I think even just yeah. managing them right because usually it's like a yeah. like a spreadsheet and then like some crazy complicated naming structure so you've got <laughs> your folder directory system and it's like yeah. you know, blah 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 but anyway yeah yeah <laughs> oh. yeah. That, yeah that's how it works man that's how it works <laughs> All right, cool. Well, that was my last question, but actually maybe one final bonus question okay. for, for people who yeah. want to hang on here. So there has been a lot, like recently there's been a lot of talk in terms of the, the changes happening in terms of data gets, that gets passed back to UA managers from Facebook, for example, right? And so we're not where the fact that Facebook is going to stop sending user level data back to studios um, people generally say that um, that you know creatives all then becomes more important be because I guess a couple of things. One, 
there's less that UA people are going to be able to do. And then Facebook and Google are just sucking up more and more of what UA people do. So wondering if you could talk about, you know, what the impact on creatives is going to be yeah. uh, based upon that data, data change and then just your general thoughts in terms of that policy. Yeah, so, um, yeah, I, I read a lot of catastrophic scenarios about, like, uh, how, how all, the, all the UA and performance marketers' like, lives are going to change. I mean, there is something that is going to happen definitely, and I'm, I'm really sure that uh, Apple will change the policy as well. And we won't see, like, um, a, lot of, a lot of data points we see n uh, nowadays. I don't think that it's going to be that catastrophic. Because a lot of uh, companies will go, will go bankrupt, and I don't think like uh, <laughs> all, all, all those guys can afford that. And I'm definitely sure that there will there will be some workarounds because there is all the time there is some workarounds, and we fa we face these kind of like policy changes already a couple of times before yeah. when we change when we moved from IDs. I'm not sure like I don't remember which IDs to IDFAs and then the mobile advertising ID. So. There's, there will be, and I think, and this is my opinion, uh, I'm kind of not that uh, not that negative on this on this <laughs> side. Uh, I still think that there will be some, some company that, or, or any group that will find a workaround. And there is always, you know, there's always uh, a way how to, because I read that you, you can't just create lookalikes anymore because of the MMPs and everybody's like, yeah, well, you can create lookalikes on Facebook platform in Facebook analytics. And um, this is pretty crucial because there are a couple of ways how to create lookalikes. And this is one of those, uh, one of that. And the same, same thing, you, you have Firebase, you have audiences there, they're connected to, to Google UAC campaigns. I mean, these changes will just, you know, make Facebook and Google bigger and um, obviously, but what we can do. Uh, <laughs> So I don't see like that uh, that much of a catastrophe there. There, so uh, and I think uh, the creative is already like super important because like all these um, like machine learning and all the automations um, um, activities that Facebook done uh, in the past and, and uh, Google as well. So yeah, I still think that uh, it's not gonna be that uh, that bad. But let's see in in couple of a uh, couple of months if I was wrong or not. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thanks so much for your time, Mate. There you have it, Mate. And also, do you have uh, two things? Do you have a final message for our audience? And then secondly, if people are wanting to contact you, is there a good way for people to get in touch with you? Definitely. Um, I'm on LinkedIn and I do have my own personal um, website, alanchari.me. I can uh, share that uh, after the, I'll after that the podcast. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So basically, um, what I would like to share is, you know, um, the creative process is super important and uh, not a lot of companies um, have that in place. So uh, definitely think about how to, how to, you know, after listening to this, um, you should have a sense uh, about how to create a, a new concept and new ideas. Uh, but still, the, this framework works for me and I don't, necessarily say that this will work for you right away and we have like we have spent a lot of time perfecting this so be careful uh, i mean there are lots of insights i believe and i hope so uh, but you need to be careful about how to implement that into your actual framework because if you have something that already is working for you don't change that but try to experiment a little bit with what i've i've said and you found useful to find a proper balance about the, the experimenting new things and uh, what works for you. But also, you know, you just don't change your your actual framework because I said something um, <laughs> something important. <laughs> because this this is something that I, I see also like a lot of a lot of times that someone just you know listen to a podcast or read a book and immediately think that this is gonna work for for uh, that company. Well, it can work, but you know, you need to be very careful what, what, you, what you try and what, uh, what you do next. So yeah, that's, uh, that's probably just uh, from a couple of comments from, from my side. Okay, great. I totally agree with that. And so thank you very much for your time, Mate. And until next time, see you later. Okay. Thank you very much for having me. Bye, Bye. guys. Bye.